get it going. Uh, I'm Dan Rosen, uh, um, host of the meeting and chair of the Alliance of Angels. Uh, for those that don't know about the Alliance of Angels, um, we are uh, based in the Seattle and invest throughout the Pacific Northwest. Um, we like to think of ourselves as being at the center of the startup funding in our region. Uh, we're the largest angel group with over 140 members. We have a mix of angel investors, um, many of the area's super angels, prominent family offices and local VCs. We're uh, an angel group that is very VC friendly. And we are also the number one funder of female-led startups in the Pacific Northwest, something we're very proud of. Um, <clears throat> we fund the most deals. Uh, we invest in over average years, over 20 deals a year with an investment of over $10 million, uh, which is more than any other angel group in the region. Um, we are also noted throughout the nation as being one of the top 10 angel groups in terms of investment every year. 40% uh, of the companies presenting at the Alliance of Angels do get funded. Uh, average amount of investment ranges between 250000 and 500000 a year. And AOA members invest in uh, startups across a wide range of business sectors throughout the entire Pacific Northwest region that does include uh, Canada. Um, having us in a deal does raise your credibility. We often find that uh, we are highly networked into other sources of capital. Uh, any number of area angel groups do attend our meetings so that they can spot good deals and bring them to their members. Uh, and 80% of the entrepreneurs who have re received funding from us have gone on to successfully complete the round. But one of the things we're particularly proud of, as many other angel groups are, is that we have, we bring more than money. Uh, our members have a wide range of business experiences across many disciplines and many sectors. Uh, a large number of our members are entrepreneurs currently or have been in the past, and they can provide invaluable business advice, contacts, uh, connections for future financing, um, uh, helping you find and identify good uh, human resource um, uh, capabilities as you begin to grow your company. So with that, um, uh, I'd like to uh, take the time to introduce our panel. Um, and uh, we have a great panel for today's event. Uh, first uh, is uh, Darren Taylor from BDO Canada. Darren is a tax partner who has been in public practice since 1998. He has provided uh, income tax, transfer pricing, sales tax services to clients in a broad range of sectors and industry. Uh, second is Shivam Kishore. Shivam is uh, with the Vancouver Economic Commission where he's manager of technology and partnerships. He combines his educational background in biomedical engineering with his passion for seeing tech enabled uh, positive and sustainable change in society. Uh, next is CJ Voss. Uh, CJ is with k &L Gates, one of the, uh, along with BDO, one of the AOA sponsors. Uh, CJ is a corporate transaction attorney whose practice spans many areas, including business life cycle from startup through exit. He's uh, represented clients in many different sectors. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I think we are ready to begin. Um, any of the panelists like to chime in with anything and please feel free to unmute yourself. Oh, ask to unmute. Dan, I just would, would like to introduce Pavan Drawanda, who is a corporate attorney with McCarthy Tetro in Vancouver. And Pavan graciously agreed to sort of join me to the extent we have, uh, you know, questions concerning legal issues and uh, legal structures in Canada, um, I can talk a little bit about typical cross-border considerations from a U.S. legal perspective, but Pavan can riff um, on, on the Canadian aspects. 
Well, that, that's just great. Uh, glad to have you on board as well, Pavan. And uh, let's kick it off. Uh, maybe I'll start by asking Shivam to uh, start with an overview of the BC ecosystem. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Thank you, and um, great to be here. I think just to really briefly lay the groundwork for the conversation, I think so, as we all know, tech sector is certainly the fastest growing sector um, in the region, in Metro Vancouver for sure. Um, I think we've got about 75,000 tech professionals in, in the Metro Vancouver region alone. Um, Vancouver is one of the top ranked cities for talent, um, and of course, um, top ranked cities for one of the top ranked cities in North America for the labor quality. Um, certainly, you know, a lack of early stage capital has been a well known issue uh, within the region uh, for the last many years. Um, that resulted in us losing a few spots in the Startup Genomes Global Ranking last year. Uh, but, you know, it's associations like AOA and others that have really uh, sort of supported and filling that void uh, by having or granting access to that, that early stage funding. Um, just a few quick stats that might be useful for the audience. Um, so direct investment uh, into Vancouver has increased uh, significantly over the last 10 years. Um, at an annual rate of about 38%. Um, and the trends is largely um, going towards uh, increasing it even more, even um, this year so far, the data we have shows a significant increase in the number of investments that are coming in. Um, America certainly um, is the largest uh, foreign um, contributor when it comes to investing in the local tech innovation economy. About 80% of all foreign investments in our region is coming from Americas, um, which is fantastic. Um, and that, of course, can be attribu attributable to a bunch of things, um, including similarities and in, in, in legalities and tax and corporate structures, which, of course, uh, fantastic power can speak a lot more on that. Um, and then the last interesting stat to note is around uh, the IP. So recently we have undertaken some research and found that 40% um, of Vancouver's organizations that have exited in 2019 exited within five years, uh, which is significantly a uh, low number compared to the rest of the Canadian ecosystem and even North American ecosystem, I would say. And that's largely attributable to the ability of organizations here to develop IP very quickly, build relationships on very quickly, uh, both in terms of financial and strategic partnerships uh, that allows early exits, which means good news for the investors um, and for organizations alike. Um, so I think overall a very exciting ecosystem. Um, I think I'm, I'm glad uh, to see continued interest and increased interest in some ways from the investors in the Americas region. Um, certainly, I think we're a great economy to look at. The key sectors that are growing are digital technologies, uh, including emerging tech like AI, blockchain, and so on. Uh, life sciences, clean technology is a sector that is gaining a lot of momentum right now. And that includes everything from uh, sort of localized manufacturing uh, in terms of electric vehicles uh, to uh, newer fuel uh, types that can offset uh, GHGs. Um, and finally, it's the VFX and the film uh, economy. So VFX, gaming, um, animation and film. Uh, so those four areas combined are sort of the most areas where we are seeing tremendous growth opportunities. Um, just to also finish off by saying that, again, like I mentioned earlier, we've seen a continued in, uh, interest from the American investors. And, and uh, I mean, this, is, this conversation is fantastic because a lot of taxation and legal considerations, while similar, can, there can be some nuances which make it a little bit difficult to have that flow of cross-border investments. And so we're also in the process of sort of developing and releasing a guide that can help sort of as a city, as that can help facilitate. So we can share more on that later on, but I hope this gives a nice overall structure for the conversation to start. Thanks, uh, th that was just great. Um, there, there'll be, uh, anybody who has questions, uh, we'll have time after the brief presentations by everybody to ask them. In the meantime, I ask you to keep your, yourselves on mute. If you want me to ask the question for you, please enter it into the chat and I would be happy to do that. Um, next up uh, would be uh, uh, CJ, can you give a little bit about 
the legal overview, corporate structuring, security laws, things to look for in term sheets for U.S. investors investing in Canada? Sure. Thank, thanks, Dan. You know, I, I think the first thing I'd like to say is whenever, um, whenever I have a inquiry or a client come to me and start talking about a cross-border investment, um, the, the first and most obvious thing that comes to mind is this is a foreign legal system. You're going into a foreign jurisdiction uh, to, to invest your, your cash. And um, that has many implications, but folks who haven't done this before tend to think that, well, how different could it be? And if it works under Delaware law or Washington law, then we should be able to do the same thing in Canada. And there are quite a few similarities, and I'll ask Pavan to to talk about that a little bit in a moment, but you know, Canada is not the US, different legal system, different structures. So that's sort of point one. Point two, always with a cross-border investment or any sort of cross-border transaction is what, what are the tax considerations at play here uh, to get your money out uh, ultimately in an exit scenario? Uh, you'll want to understand if there are any unique uh, or different tax considerations in connection with an investment in a Canadian vehicle. And then third, and this is really less significant, generally speaking, but again, it goes to, goes to the point of investing in a foreign jurisdiction. You know, are there any special regulatory considerations, uh, any special you know, licensing uh, or other regulatory issues that you need to consider in making the investment. So those are sort of the top three issues uh, on my mind when a client comes in and starts talking about a cross-border deal, angel investment or otherwise. There are a number of areas where you and your advisors can sort of perform the same type of work that you'd, you'd, you'd undertake with a Washington or a Delaware entity or any U.S. entity. You know, the business due diligence, it's the same, essentially. We're viewing the financial projections, same concepts. Legal diligence, sure, a U.S. lawyer can review documents, review key contracts, engage in a reading comprehension exercise and do some issue spotting. But at the end of the day, if the business is formed in Canada and the material contracts are in Canada, um, most likely uh, your, your advisor will want to consult with Canadian counsel. And I guess to put a finer point on that, depending on your risk tolerance, and the amount of you know, investment that you're talking about and perhaps the nature of the business, it, it may make sense in many cases to be, to go right to Canadian Council to, to help in an efficient way. I'm gonna pause there and invite Pavan from McCarthy Tetro, who is a very experienced uh, emerging growth company and, and venture capital lawyer in, in, in Vancouver to, Talk to us a little bit about sort of the high level issues that he would consider. That's all right, Dan. Sure, just before you do, we had a question right at the beginning from Alex Wick, who said, we'd love to learn more about the advantage and disadvantages of ULC versus LLCs as subsidiary branches in Canada. Yeah, you know, maybe I can kind of you know build that into you know my piece here. But uh, yeah, very nice to meet everybody at least virtually. Uh, my name is Pavan Jawanda, as CJ mentioned. I'm a uh, partner in the Vancouver office of McCarthy Tetro. Focus a lot on uh, you know, early stage and emerging growth companies, uh, focusing on corporate finance, the emergence of acquisitions, the exit events, etc. And very pleased to meet everybody. We're having actually a, a surprisingly pleasant day out in Vancouver for uh, 
a mid-October day, and hopefully everybody in Seattle is kind of having the same. Uh, yeah, so as CJ kind of mentioned, you know, there are a lot of similarities between you know, Canada and the U.S. from a bunch of different perspectives. And obviously, Siobhan mentioned, I think very rightly, that uh, you know, the biggest you know, source of investment for Canadian companies and even BC companies is coming from the U.S. So, you know, very active angel investor you know, kind of community out here, uh, but then also coming in from the U.S. as well as kind of venture capital, private equity, and a lot of strategic investment as well from the bigger tech companies. And so interestingly in BC, I would say on an exit event and you know, almost you know, the large majority of those transactions, you know, BC companies are being sold to US strategic companies. So there's a real big American influence you know, here in, in, BC, in BC and then more broadly in Canada. And so that does give the benefit of a lot of similarity in, in kind of how we structure our deals, how we document our deals. So any angel investor looking to come into BC, you know, will at least you know, not be completely uh, it, this won't be completely foreign territory or unfamiliar. You know, the suite of package, the suite of documents that you're typically looking at is pretty similar again to what you're seeing in the U.S. So you're usually seeing some kind of subscription agreement, uh, some kind of term sheet, the shareholders agreement, you know, amended articles for share rights, etc. You know, the one thing you don't see in Canada very often are safe agreements. You know, they are becoming a bit more popular, and obviously they're really prevalent in the U.S. among the angel investor community. Not really haven't really gained that kind of traction here in Canada just yet. Uh, and, you know, and that includes BC naturally. And, you know, partly because you know, the, the kind of startup community is obviously doing very well, as Siobhan had pointed out, but, you know, it's not a, the kind of pace it's been moving at in the U.S. And so, you know, safe agreements oftentimes kind of are considered founder friendly. And so, you know, in the Valley and kind of elsewhere in the U.S., a lot of founders have been able to advocate that and angel investors. It's great for them because it's quick, reduces legal spend. I don't think we're there in Canada just yet, but there are some organizations that are actually trying to work on that and try to standardize some of the documents like NACO, like some of the accelerators, uh, is similar to what Y Combinator has done. So I think that the, the first point of, you know, kind of real similarity uh, is, you know, the documents that you're typically looking at here are not kind of completely dissimilar to what you're seeing in the U.S. The, the one thing that I think frustrates a lot of angel investors or just, you know, investors from the U.S. generally when they're coming to Canada, including D.C., is the fragmented nature of our securities law system out here. Uh, you know, in the U.S., obviously, you have the federal SEC that oversees and governs uh, a lot of the securities law issues out there. In B.C., it's much more fragmented. It's really a patchwork system. We have no national securities regulator. Uh, you know, there is no Canadian Securities Commission. You know, all of the provinces and all the territories have not just their own commission, their regulatory bodies. We all have our own securities acts as well. So depending on the province that you're looking to invest in, you're going to have to look at you know, the Securities Act and the regulations of that particular province. So that could be a source of frustration for some investors. You know, most angel investors you know, that are coming into BC are coming in under what's called an accredited investor exemption in our case in order to avoid all the prospectus requirements. Uh, and again, you know, most of you I'm sure will have heard of something like that in the US because it was a very similar concept, exactly the same term that's used out there by the SEC. Yeah, but if you are looking to invest in Canada as an angel investor, you know, in most cases, you're going to be coming in under that exemption. Yeah, so what that means is, as far as financial thresholds go, that you guys need to be you know, cognizant of. That means you know, at least a million dollars in financial assets, and that really means cash and securities, you know, it, or uh, you know, net income of at least 200000 individually or 300,000 household for the last two years and the reasonable expectation that will continue. Uh, or you know, if we're just counting net assets, not just financial assets, at least 5 million in net assets. And then you know, if you're a corporation or if you formed an entity you know, or an LLC or an, LL, or an LP, then in that case, again, it's a $5 million net asset test. So those are the thresholds that any angel investor is going to be looking at. And again, that's pretty harmonized across all the provinces and territories. So once you actually hit those thresholds, you should be pretty comfortable that you can invest anywhere in Canada. So I think you know, that's a big difference between our system. It's like, oh, sorry. it's like that's really similar to what we experience here. Exactly. So expect it to be very similar. That's right. And you know, the, the philosophy that we have you know, in Canada from a securities law perspective is similar to you know, what the SEC has, which is you know, if you hit those financial thresholds, you can, the presumption is you know, that you can manage your own affairs, that you don't need the benefit of all of these securities laws and protections, including prospectuses, you know, which is the equivalent of our registration statement. Uh, you know, so you know, that's kind of the same philosophy 
or kind of rationale that underlies a lot of our securities laws out here. So once you kind of get past that and that big difference, again, you know, CJ's kind of rightly pointed out, you know, a lot of the diligence issues are going to be pretty similar between Canada and the U.S. Again, you know, we share a border, we share a lot of cultural similarities, a lot of business similarities, and our capital markets are really dependent on yours to some extent, you know, as we can kind of see in, in today's market. So, you know, legal diligence, kind of the, the path, you know, forward on that is pretty similar to, again, what you're seeing in the U.S. Uh, and CJ has rightly pointed out that tax is obviously a driving factor yeah. how you structure an investment. I think that's kind of where the ULC versus LLC point can kind of come up. Uh, the one thing to know in Canada is we have, you know, in none of the jurisdictions actually has an LLC. So an LLC is kind of really uniquely a, an American vehicle, your, your limited liability companies, you know, whether it's kind of Delaware or elsewhere. You know, what we have to achieve kind of those flow through tax objectives are, you know, limited partnerships, which are very similar to its limited partnerships out in the U.S., but then also in some provinces, you know, what are called unlimited liability companies. So those are the ULCs. So think of those as really the uh, analog to you know an LLC in the U.S. and you know, they achieve that flow through objective that you investors have, U.S. investors have, especially for branch offices, uh, you know, to actually have you know income pass through and you know, to be taxed upstairs as opposed to within the ULC. So I'll let Darren, obviously from BDO, speak to to that a bit because you know tax is obviously the, the driving factor for that. But uh, yeah, that's just obviously a, a very high level. A quick spiel on some of the main differences and similarities. Thanks, Pavan. Uh, as uh, Mike Volker was quick to point out, that there is no exchange rate adjustment. So if you're an accredited investor, you're more than an accredited investor in Canada. Yeah. Uh, I'm really pleased that uh, our last speaker, after overcoming some major uh, technical problems, uh, Thalza Lee has been able to join us, and so I'll let her introduce herself, and then we'll move on to Darren to talk about the uh, tax issues. So Thalza, um, just let me say I've known Thalza for quite a while, and um, she has a long history and involvement in angel investing, and is one of my go-to people along with Mike uh, uh, when I have questions on uh, angel investing in Canada. So. Um, uh, Go ahead, I think you're unmuted now. All right, thank you very much. Uh, next time we meet, I hope I will have a brand new device. <laughs> That's all I can say. Um, yeah, so I, I've been working with Mike Volker with the Vantech Angel Network. Uh, we're almost as old as Alliance of Angels. And like Mike, I also run uh, some angel funds. And there's a few of them that I run and the most active one in the angel equity realm is e-fund. Anything else I need to add? You can ask me questions. Yeah, you might want to say a few words about your perceptions of Americans investing in Canada. In, you know, I, I see a lot more American interest in our Canadian companies, and that's a, that's a really good thing, too. And I'd like to see more cross-border I, I think there's fewer Canadians going down south than there is Americans coming back up. And, you know, that has to do with our exchange rate. Um, it's, it's very favorable in the Americans' uh, favor. And another reason why there are fewer Canadians coming down to invest in American companies is that we, in BC, we have a very favorable jurisdiction for angel investment. We have a a generous 30% tax credit, which has been phenomenal in growing our angel investment community and uh, not seeing the same sort of uh, tax credit regime in Washington state or down south anywhere, or and plus the exchange rate, um, that that sort of slows things down for Canadians to invest in American companies. That's actually not that true when you get to later stage companies, surprisingly. That only seems to affect the very early stage, angel stage companies, where angels like to invest close to home and would be able to keep a close eye on their nascent investments. Very good, thank you. And I'd like to ask Darren maybe to comment a little bit on some of the tax issues that anybody uh, from the U.S. investing uh, north of the border need to think about or worry about? 
Yeah, yeah thanks very much, uh, Dan, and a big thanks as well to, uh, to the Alliance for uh, having me in today. Um, yeah, I mean, I, all the comments we've been hearing so far are just great comments, and I kind of echo, um, you know, there seems to be a really robust market. It has been for a bunch of years in, in Canada. Where, I mean, when I just look at our, our desk flow of work coming through our BDO office, uh, through a couple of key partners. I mean, we're seeing real significant um, investment files coming through. Um, from a tax perspective, um, I mean, I, I'm a bit of an optimist. I kind of like to think that the Canadian market is fairly easy, easy to navigate uh, from, from a tax point of view. But that being said, I, I think the key, the key issue, which has come up a couple of times, is just, you know, make sure you've got the structuring right. Um, so when you're looking from the U.S. side coming in, you know, it's great to have a U.S. advisor with you working in tandem with a Canadian advisor. So, you know, either uh, you know, McCarthy's or, you know, BDO or an accounting kind of legal firm together on both sides really does kind of smooth the stream and, and just protects the invest investor from a legal point of view and from an investment point of view, getting it done right. Um, you know, so again, I think that if you're coming from U.S. into Canada, the starting point is really, okay, what's the entity on the U.S. side? How do you match it up properly on a Canadian side for you know, good tax efficiency and so forth? Um, and, and there are, you know, a number, kind of a number of options depending on what the objectives are. Uh, there's also some, you know, pitfalls as well, too. One has to be fairly careful with. Um, but, you know, that being said, I mean, I'll, what I'll do is I'll just kind of jump ahead to just a brief comments on once in, once set up, it's, it's a, a target that's been acquired um, through, a, say, a, a corporation on the Canadian side. You know, um, the, the compliance uh, side of things on the, uh, in Canada, I, I think, are, you know, we've got a complex set of rules as well, too. But in terms of, you know, managing the number of kind of desk files that you have in terms of compliance, corporate tax, sales tax, payroll things, so forth like that. I, I find it generally fairly, fairly decent system to work through. Um, and that's just anecdotal only because I, I, I um, you know, I hear, uh, uh, you know, tales on the U.S. side. There's just so many more jurisdictions down there um, that adds to the complexity for a, a broad-based kind of business. So on the Canadian side, I mean, again, uh, we, are, we see a lot of files come in. We've got a lot of people kind of in our wheelhouse that we can handle, you know, immigration issues. Do your, um, if you've got a employees coming up, you know, um, or, um, you know, do we need visas, you know, waivers and so forth like that. Um, but, uh, in, you know, in terms of, um, you know, just a brief comment too, uh, you know, we've been in this really bizarre kind of lockdown mode. And in some ways, uh, you know, the last six months, I mean, some of our, our practice areas have just been extraordinarily busy, which is good. It's a good signal to the economy because I think we have you know, more, there's, there's, there's uh, some uncertainty certainly ahead. Um, but in terms of the robustness, I think particularly in the deals we're seeing coming into Vancouver, more broadly into Canada, we're seeing some really big numbers. So I think there's, there's a really robust optimism that I've really experienced this year. And I think a number of our partners in our firm as well, um, are in just in terms of their busyness are, are, are seeing as well too. So I, I think we're in a really interesting time, really interesting space. Um, for uh, investors coming into Canada and to the point going out of Canada, but I think the capital is in favor of coming in. Uh, Darren, a question for you. Uh, at the Alliance of Angels, we probably see um, three or four Canadian deals a quarter that come down primarily from Vancouver or, or elsewhere in BC. There's always the question of the uh, BC, the EBC uh, tax credit and having Americans find a way to be able to claim that tax credit that Canadian citizens get. I, I know from Mike Volker that, that it's possible to find ways to do that. Can you comment on that? And unfortunately, I can't specifically because I'm, I'm kind of more core tax and I feel bad that I, I can't. <laughs> um, um, uh, so I'll, I'll defer back, maybe I'll ask, um, um, the van, or uh, if you have kind of, or, or even back to uh, CJ, any kind of comment on that? Um, again, that that's, that that specific item is not really well within my wheelhouse, so I, I defer to somebody who's got a better comment for the group. Okay, um, and uh, I think we've had all the panelists get a chance to talk now. There are. I'd like to turn it over for questions because there's a ton of questions on chat, and. Um, 
let me uh, sort of turn it to uh, who was the first one here. There was a question from Peter Muller about uh, Delaware C Corp with the Canadian subsidiary uh, or a California subsidiary, I guess. Uh, can you do you want to ask that, Peter, so that uh, I think I think you can unmute yourself to ask. I guess not. The question was, is a Delaware C Corp with a California subsidiary for a California based company commonly, or can, I guess it must be a Canadian subsidiary for a Canadian based company commonly used. Uh, anybody want to try to tackle that one? Yeah, well, yeah maybe I, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead no, you well, start. My, my reaction was if we're really talking about investment into BC entities, I think typically the entity right out of the box will be you know, an entity formed under uh, one of the provincial corporate statutes. Um, if, if the question is, you know, what's the right vehicle for the angel to invest in, we can, we can talk about that, but maybe Pavan, I'll get out of your way now, but I, I think right out of the box, the entity will be a, you know, a BC company or Nova Scotia entity or whatever. Yeah, no, so it's a good question. And obviously if there's already a pre-existing kind of corporate structure and there's all, already a Delaware company in the mix because you've incorporated an angel fund or you have some other kind of organizational vehicle, then kind of the structure that you're mentioning where a Delaware company or just any kind of US state company, you know, invests into a BC company or, you know, some other provincial company is not uncommon at all. It's actually quite common, you know, that it gets done through a U.S. kind of corporate vehicle if that's the way that you actually desire to set up your investment. I see a lot of our angel investors, whether Canadian or U.S., are actually, you know, just investing individually. So they would just invest directly into the equity of a BC company. And so, you know, Derek has to speak to income tax filing obligations kind of associated with that. But, you know, one of the desires sometimes is to have some kind of corporate blocker vehicle. So it's not the individual who is actually having to file in Canada, but you just have a corporation that kind of manages that exercise. Uh, and so, yeah, CJ, you know, you're absolutely right. The, the kind of target you know, entity is usually, I would say, kind of a BC or, you know, other, you know, provincial or federally incorporated company. You know, I did see a question about kind of, you know, what are the benefits of going federal versus you know, BC or provincial. The one big, and, and a lot of this is on the fringes, you know, not enough to really kind of you know, significantly matter over the long term, I would say, you know, a lot of it's kind of more procedural. Uh, you know, one of the big benefits of going federal is, you know, you just kind of register the name once and you're just done with it. You could do business, you know, federally under that name across Canada, whereas if you do it provincially, you do have to go through an additional step to extra provincially register. But a big advantage, you know, if you're kind of setting up a startup, if you're investing in a startup, and it's not set up in BC or some of the other provinces that have this, uh, you know, about incorporating in BC is, you know, there are no direct or residency requirements. So if you as an angel investor are interested in getting on the board, not just an advisory kind of board role, but a real director role, uh, or, you know, you just want some American presence on that board, then BC is actually quite favorable. Uh, you know, whereas kind of if you went federal and incorporated in Canada federally, you know, there is a requirement that at least 25% of your directors be Canadian residents actually living here in, in Canada. So that's, the, you know, one of the reasons why a lot of our kind of American clients and just, you know, foreign clients, you know, overseas, you know, really like the BC corporate vehicle. Yeah, Darren, Yes, I did. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to maybe jump to the next question. Um, and, and that is uh, common stock. Jeff Kanan asks that by his experience, most of the companies he sees are offering common stock, whereas most angel investors in the US would only ever invest in preferred stock. And maybe we can uh, go to uh, several members of the panel to talk about that because uh, you know, we've been, we've been training angels for years in the U.S. If you're going to do an angel round, do, do preferred shares. So anybody want to comment? I'll start maybe, off. Maybe I'll, 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 throw, I'll throw another question in there. What about convertible notes for, uh, for, for Canadian entities? That's actually another great question. So, so go ahead, Thelso. Right, so I'll start off about common versus preferreds. Uh, with the angel funds, like the ones that Mike and I run, 
the preferreds are actually preferred. It, it was the, uh, once upon a time commons were were the vehicle of choice, but lately, within the last few years, it, the preferreds are actually the way to go. And actually, my own fund, e fund, we actually prefer the preferreds. And re with regards to convertible notes and safes and other uh, non equity investment vehicles, uh, the fund that Mike and I run, we are actually formed under the, the regulations of the BC government. It is all tied to this 30% tax credit. And they regulate what sort of vehicles qualify for that 30% tax credit. And for a long time, convertible notes and safes were not considered eligible for that 30% tax credit. Now they are, but under very uh, specific situations. And maybe Mike, you, I think you're unmuted. You can chime in too and talk maybe also about the EBC credit. Yeah, no, to Felsel's point, uh, definitely seeing more um, preferred share deals getting done, although commons are still quite popular. And because Canadians like to copy Americans, safes have become popular and Felsel and I go to great lengths to discourage them. And there are legally legally easier ways of dealing with it. I mean, you just simply issue issue shares, preps or common, and then you, you have an adjustment because that's all you're really doing with the safe, except with the safe, you're in kind of a no man's land. You're not a, a shareholder, you're just a, an unsecured creditor you don't vote at meetings and it you know it kind of makes sense for an incubator like y combinator where you have almost an assured a round taking place at some point but if you don't have that assurance i think i think safes just suck and there's a there's a better way of doing it on my website i've made a little description of something called the safety which is a simple agreement for future equity today uh, instead of equity tomorrow but uh, to the point about the tax credits, um, uh, there are, I see a number of people on the call. I see Jim Thompson, Joe Jarzembowski, Lars Johansson, and they've all uh, invested through um, VCCs that I've been involved in uh, in British Columbia. A VCC is um, simply a holding company. The legal structure is it's just a regular Canadian controlled private corporation, just like a regular I guess in the US, the closest thing would be a C Corp, maybe Pavan, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but just a regular CCPC. And um, it uh, is a holding company which can issue uh, the tax credits to investors. And what you can do, and it was actually suggested to me by government people over a decade ago, that um, you get a nominee, you get anyone in British Columbia who's a resident to purchase the shares and then um, the next minute uh, that investor can flip the shares to the U.S. investor at whatever price uh, uh, happens to be agreed to or negotiated. So, you know, if I'm buying, if I'm doing it for someone, I could buy shares for $10 and then I could sell them to Lars, for example, for $7 and I've got my tax credit. And it, uh, it works really, really well. And I can tell you that millions, literally millions of dollars have been brought in to BC from the US and from other parts of the world using that um, approach. Um, I don't know about, uh, I don't want to take away any uh, credit from, from the lawyers on the call, but I know that Faskins has made a bundle of money as a law firm uh, in applying that, uh, that methodology to, to, to raising capital. I know in the one example, we had Zymeworks, which is a, a BC biotech company, which is now listed on New York and is trading around $46, $47. Um, long before it went public, we brought in $10 million from outside of BC using that, uh, that uh, scheme. And um, the reason it works is that because for a VCC or for the holding company, um, there is no hold period. A lot of people think that you're obligated to hold shares for five years, which is the case if you invest directly in a private company, but it's not the case if you're investing in a VCC holding company structure. And in the case of my angel fund, I've brought in 
maybe, I don't know, maybe a couple of million into the fund from a lot of uh, people in Washington State, Alaska, and even overseas. So yeah, it, it works and, and it's not super complicated. There is a tendency, I think, for the BC government to, uh, for some reason or another, they're not as keen on it as they used to be. Uh, but technically, it's, it's not, not a problem. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, uh, in general, maybe, uh, Thalzel, you can comment on this, or maybe um, uh, Shivam. Uh, what do you see about, what, what lessons do American investors investing in Canadian companies um, learn? Are there things that we should know before we invest? Well, there's certainly an, an advantage of sharing that border because, uh, and, and also similar cultures too. We're, we both speak uh, English and so th there's, there's a lot there, but is there a difference? I don't see a difference that's very significant. Um, I think the only difference would be the tax treatment of your investment, whether you're on the north side of the border or south side. I think I would, I would probably second that. And the only thing I would add to that is, like I was mentioning earlier, the time to exit. So again, just you know, based on the data that we've been seeing and the analysis of the data, it, it has become quite apparent that organizations in Vancouver particularly have a tendency to exit at a much faster rate than organizations elsewhere in Canada, particularly organizations uh, in the US. Um, so I mean, typical sort of, again, average uh, amount to exit is about five years, um, which again speaks to sort of solid IP value and, and then sort of the connectivity of the ecosystem. So I think that's something that benefits investors in a lot of ways, depending on, you know, how you invest um, and, and what your mindset is. So that's something to consider for sure. A uh, question for anybody who wants to take this one, but um, we have seen uh, problems uh, with the U.S. immigration system and H-1B visas being very limited. Uh, I've heard from a number of my friends in Vancouver and around Canada that uh, that makes Can Canadian companies a lot more attractive uh, for attracting talent. Anybody want to comment on that? I'll start, Dan. Uh, I run the Startup Visa Program, which is a Canadian federal program for Vantech. And we've had a strong uptick in applications into, uh, into Vantech, trying to be part of the Startup Visa and amazingly, there are a, a, a number of Americans who want to come and st set up their business in Canada, which <laughs> take, I, I have data. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll probably double that too. So we've got data as well. We've been collecting data on this paradigm shift, at least particularly, I mean, it's been happening for the last many years, but I think particularly in 2019, the data is quite suggestive of the number of inquiries have certainly gotten higher in terms of the interest that um, American organizations particularly are having in considering uh, sort of looking at Vancouver, Canada as, a, as an option to either set up their corporations, um, in some cases, move their HQs or have satellite offices open up in a big way. So uh, certainly that's a growing trend. I think that can be attributed to a number of factors um, that are no secret to anyone, but um, definitely a trend uh, that, that, is, that we're seeing for sure. Yeah, and you know, uh, when, when Vantech signed on to be a, one of the designated angel groups you know, in Canada to process these startup visa applications, there was just merely a handful uh, at, back in 2014, 2015, and that I was just doing it for free and as a service to the, to the Vantech angel investors. Now it's a whole operation. Tomorrow I'm chairing a whole pre-screening committee just on startup visa candidates. I've hired someone to do nothing but process startup visa applications. I'll tell you, it's go gone up exponentially. The immigrants are coming from all over the world and in like I said before, an increasing proportion of, of them are Americans. Wow. So 
Next, I'd like to shift gears a little bit, and this is for CJ and Darren. Uh, if you, if as an American, I invest in a Canadian company and I'm lucky enough to get an exit, um, what are the legal and then the tax ramifications of getting my money? Well, <clears throat> I think I have the easy, I have the easy uh, uh, answer on, on this one, and then maybe Bob and the rest of the crew can chime in. Um, you know, you're you're an equity holder. Uh, your equity has just been converted into cash or other property. Um, you know, let let's let's get it back to the U.S. But before we do, and hopefully at the time we made the investment let's make sure we call the tax lawyer or your tax advisor, because um, it's really, from my perspective, the tax consideration that is an important element of um, thinking about investing in a Canadian company, because obviously the investment's being made with an eye to a future exit, and that means converting your equity into cash, and you know, how do we how do we get that cash across the border in the most tax efficient way we possibly can? Well, luckily we have Darren on board. So Darren, do you want to comment on that? Well, I, I, I can a bit. Yeah. I mean, you're in some ways though, if you're a U.S. person, then when I, in my mind, I kind of go, okay, if you're Canadian, we're talking Canadian tax resident. If you're U.S., we're talking U.S. tax resident. So I kind of define the size of the border. Um, so if there's been an exit and there's, there's, there's funds that have been realized that then need to get across to a bank account in the U.S., um, you know, the real drivers, but the, you know, on the, let's call it the capital gain on the back end is, is going to be the, in the hands of the U.S. recipient, which is the U.S. kind of resident. Um, you know, it, it, depending on what the underlying, there can be some withholding issues, but, but usually if, um, uh, you know, it just becomes looking at the underlying what the underlying gain is in, in relation to the security. But you know, if it's not um, taxable Canadian property, and kind of under the treaty, then it, you know, there's there there can be some exercises that one needs to go through to make sure that um, withholding compliance matters are taken care of as part of the exit kind of strategy. I, I think there was also a, a another question a little bit earlier on, which was a, a great question as well too, which is. You know what's the timing of the, of the advice, and I think it's been underscored already. Which is, you know, on the way in, <laughs> uh, while you're here, and and kind of on the way out as well too. And I think you know there's a number of variables, be it uh, an individual investing in shares, be it an individual with, you know, a corporate vehicle, corporate vehicle investing into the Canadian side, uh, so on and so forth. So I think it's very fact driven. One has to be careful with that. Um, um, but again, I think with, with good legal, good accounting advice, accounting tax advice, I, you know, all the way through the investment process, then you should be well positioned to, to realize the proceeds tax efficiently. And that's, that's clearly, you know, the, the, the objective. The one thing I would actually just add from a Canadian perspective and CJ and kind of Darren have already talked about this and I think it's kind of great advice that one kind of structure on an exit that just Americans are not accustomed to seeing that is pretty common in Canada is something called a plan of arrangement. And, and this is kind of like a, uh, an acquisition form that we use quite often here in Canada when a company gets pretty big in terms of its shareholders. You know, so in the US you spend all this kind of time, in Canada you do it as well, negotiating you know, drag along rights in a shareholders agreement about kind of when we could force other shareholders to exit. And great to have in a contract. In BC and Canada, there's still a lot of kind of question. There's a big question mark as to how enforceable those really are if push came to shove and you actually had to rely upon it. So in order to kind of avoid that noise and uncertainty, a lot of companies will just go through a court process to sell the company. So that's pretty novel and new to American investors because they just don't really go through that. Everything is done through a share purchase agreement or maybe a merger. So that's kind of one thing. And then increasingly, and I'm sure Darren, you, you've seen this as well, exits in Canada to American buyers are happening by way of asset deals, even in the technology space and kind of other non-tech sectors, you know, big kind of driving factor was just, you know, the, the recent U.S. tax reform where asset deals just became so beneficial to U.S. investors getting step ups in the tax basis of assets, et cetera. You know, but because of the fact that obviously Americans, you know, have a lot of leverage here when they're trying to buy 
a Canadian company in some cases for emerging companies, a lot of times they do prefer to do the asset deal and kind of push in that direction. So that's just an additional step that you'd have to go through. You may not actually be selling your shares at all, maybe the company selling really all of the assets and then have to spit that money up to you through a dividend. Cool, thank you. Well, uh, given the time we're living in, um, the elephant in the room is COVID-19. And um, the border is still closed, I believe, isn't it? And uh, therefore, I'd like to ask, uh, what are the impacts of COVID-19 on the trends we're seeing in BC for um, American companies and for Canadians investing in Canadian companies in BC? Is, is COVID-19 having uh, any major impact or is it um, everything happening virtually or are you having more face-to-face -face meetings these days? Okay, I'll start. Uh, we haven't skipped a beat. My fund, uh, eFund, has been making an investment every single month for, since the lockdown, the official lockdown back in March. So we've made about four investments since then. I know uh, Mike has, has just uh, come through an a AGM for his fund, so I'll let him speak to that fund. And as far as activities are concerned, we're actually seeing more people attend our meetings. We regularly get around 100 people showing up at our Bantech meetings every single month. And that's more than what we can fit into a room. So I think people are thinking, okay, they don't have to commute. It's just so much easier to congregate and see deals. And of course, um, your colleague, Yi Jan, has been running the Pacific Northwest Angel Group. And, and I, I see that as being very well attended. And we certainly, or certainly our companies are getting a, a lot of love from south of the border for what, um, about their ventures raising money. Thanks. Shivam, I think you wanted to chime in here. I was just thinking that's again, we've got data to sort of substantiate that, uh, that claim that yeah, definitely we haven't seen um, a drop in the number of investments or deal flows coming in um, ever since you know the pandemic hit. Uh, so we've got data from March, and certainly at a city level from government, we're keeping tracks on the amount of investments coming in and the drops or the increments in. And there's no drop. Uh, I wouldn't say there's been a substantial increment, but been a steady sort of state um, compared to where we were last year. Um, certainly, again, a bulk of those investments coming in from the Americas, so a continued increase um, in the investments coming in, certainly. So one thing that we sometimes get asked when companies pitch to the Alliance of Angels from Canada, uh, often if we lead an investment in a company, we'll take a board seat. Are there any unique requirements, restrictions, or anything on an American taking a board seat on a Canadian company? Should we do it? Should we worry about doing it? I think Pavan wanted to answer this one. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. No, I can speak to that. So yeah, it's pretty uh, not uncommon at all you know, for angel investors, especially VC investors, to take seats on a board. So the considerations that kind of largely apply are you know, very similar to what you have in the U.S. I see as a director, you have fiduciary duties to the company, kind of a duty of care, a duty of loyalty. You know, the benefit in Canada is you know, we're just not, not yet at least, as litigious as the U.S. is around kind of director lawsuits, just even around kind of corporate and commercial lawsuits. So you're a bit more insulated, I think, in Canada generally, you know, than you are kind of in the U.S., you know, depending on kind of which space you're obviously you know, on the board in or which space the target company is in. So I would take kind of the tips to you if you are thinking about getting on the board of a company. A, you know, I already mentioned the director residency point, you know, you have to kind of be mindful of that, you know, is it even permissible to have an American resident, you know, on the board if, um, you know, the place of incorporation actually has residency requirements. So yeah, again, kind of a plug for BC, it is one of those jurisdictions that just doesn't have those. So you can have a fully American board if you really wanted to. Uh, and then, you know, obviously you would, depending on kind of the risk of the company, the industry it's in, I would really push for director and officer insurance. You know, a lot of startup and emerging companies don't really do that. There are a lot of insurance brokers that are a bit more kind of attuned to the emerging company market, you know, with more reasonable premiums because they just don't have that scale to really expose themselves to a lot of risk. And if you're not getting you know, DNO insurance because it's just not economical, then at the very least having a, a good solid indemnification agreement in place and maybe building in indemnification into the 
the corporate bylaws. Um, I, I'll ask another question that sort of got thrown out here is, uh, you know, we love when our companies uh, wind up doing an IPO. Um, and unfortunately for most angels, not enough of our companies wind up doing IPOs, they get acquired. Uh, I know we're very fortunate at the Alliance of Angels to have had a company, a couple companies that have gone through IPOs, including most recently DocuSign. Uh, if a Canadian company uh, is fortunate enough to do a listing, um, does it, do they often do listings on the Canadian exchange? And if so, what's the liquidity interest there? If they come to America, I guess we get American issued shares, so then we don't have to worry, right? Anybody want to comment on that? I could, give, I could give you an example of a really good one that happened recently. You might have heard of uh, Nuve in Montreal. Um, they went public on Toronto, and uh, but you can trade in U.S. dollars. And uh, the CEO said um, uh, by doing that, they can avoid the costs of listing in New York, and they have found no resistance by U.S. investors to, to trade their shares on the TSX as long as it's... Uh, denominated in U.S. dollars. Darren, any issues we should know about on those things? You're on mute. Here we go. Sorry, I'm panicking, <laughs> getting to the bottom looking for it. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's, kind of, uh, that's kind of legal stock exchange stuff. And I was just thinking to myself, I myself, I said, I'm going to defer that one to the van because again, I'm, my wheelhouse is kind of core tax. And that I think that's the legal side of things. So I, I would refer to an answer to Pavan if that would work or, or anybody else. I was just thinking just from, we just... from a tax point of view, do we get, um, I guess if you trade trade the Toronto shares in for dollars, it, it's a US tax issue, not, not a transfer issue at all. That's, that'd be my first take on it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, again, you, you've got your, your investor on the U.S. side with an interest on the Canadian side. Your, the big drivers on the tax bill are going to come from that person, assuming they don't have, you know, kind of nexus on the Canadian side. The difference now being you, you've got a public listed share on a foreign stock exchange, you've got FX differences, but, but functionally your tax complications or reality is going to be the, the, the residency of the investor, which in this case, we're assuming on the U.S. side, I think it's largely driven on the U.S. And I know that many years ago when I did my first Canadian investment, there were a lot of issues about harmonization of tax code. And I think they, they've all gone away, haven't they? <laughs> well, so the, the, the buzzword of harmonization is, is largely sales tax driven. Um, and which is kind of not really terribly important for this kind of this conversation. Um, but in terms of, you know, I mean, I think not mentioned yet. I mean, I, I think, you know, Canada's tax regime in terms of, you know, the burden at, at the Canadian corporate level, you know, is on average, you know, 25, 20 to 25, 27% kind of combined corporate tax level within a, you know, Canadian sub level. Uh, that that effective burden of corporate tax is still somewhat favorable compared to other jurisdictions, um, and uh, albeit with some 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 curiosity about what the, the 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 farther term future is going to look like, given the current levels of spending that's going on, um, I, I think there will be a reconciling moment in time when we have to figure out what we're going to do with our tax rates on the Canadian side and U.S. I think we're we're. Canada, I think, has more sensitivity to tax rates than the U.S. does. Ours will go up. Um, the U.S., I think, has more leverage, I think, political leverage to keep them, you know, keep them at the rates that they are. But uh, that's clearly a U.S., that's opinion on U.S., and I, you know, I'll leave it at that. It's now four o'clock. We're supposed to end. Uh, any last words anybody wants to make before we sign off? I'll, it's Aaron. I'll just say two, one quick thing. Uh, you know, um, I, this has been an amazing um, uh, time that we've had together this afternoon. Thanks again to the Alliance and, and for uh, all the people that are on. I mean, reach out to the people that have been uh, involved. And again, I think it's been, you know, mentioning you know, good advice at the beginning while you're here and on the way out. Um, you know, it is really, really optimal for protecting your investments. So that's my little last word of advice.
and I'd like to thank all the panelists for the time they put in on this. Uh, what, what a great n base of knowledge. Uh, and I'd urge people to look at Canadian deals. If you're an AOA member and you're on this call, we get them coming through. Uh, don't shy away from them. Uh, you can get great returns in Canadian companies. Uh, I'm currently holding shares in uh, quite a bit, uh, quite a few Canadian companies. I'd like it if they would go liquid and get my money up, but until they do, I'm, I'm sitting happy. So uh, thank you again. And uh, again, thanks to every one of the panelists for all your contributions and for all the people who participated for their great questions. Thank you, Dan. Thank really, you. Uh, really appreciate being part of this virtual event. We'll be holding our next Vantech meeting coming up soon. And if anybody's interested in that, uh, we'll give you a special promo code. Thanks. Well, thanks again. And, uh, um, Thank you. Uh, for all your help. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, see you.